Hey everyone, so today I'm going to talk about performativity coming out of the work of Judith Butler, uh, specifically the text Gender Trouble and Bodies That Matter. Now, in order to grasp this term, we must first dissociate it from the idea of a performance, because a performance denotes a kind of deliberate act. So like actors or, you know, people in a any other kind of demonstration that are performing something. When Judith Butler talks about performativity, she's talking about day-to-day -day actions that go unnoticed. They aren't thought of in advance. They aren't planned out as a performances. They are rather spontaneous and they happen sub or unconsciously. Now before jumping into it in more detail, I just want to say, if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can do that at theory underscore and underscore philosophy to see mostly pictures of my cats. Uh, if you want to contribute in any way, you can like, share, subscribe, that helps a lot. Uh, if you want to contribute monetarily, that'd be wonderful via Patreon or PayPal. There are links for all that. And I have to extend my thanks to everyone who's contributed so far. Um, every little bit helps and you've done an amazing job helping me keep this going. And I hope to be able to keep it going for many uh, years. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find it in podcast form where there won't be any ads. I know I get a lot of complaints about ads on YouTube, but it's my way to generate a little bit of extra revenue um, so that you won't find any ads in the podcast forms. If you're listening to this in a, on a podcast already, you can find the video on YouTube. Um, and it's more or less it, I guess. Now, in order to understand performativity, I like to think of it in terms of a snowball. So a snowball might be created by someone um, or it might have you know happened naturally by nature via an avalanche or something like that. But when a snowball rolls down a hill, it accumulates a certain mass. And it is in that accumulation and size, in that accumulation, that it actually becomes more and more of a snowball. It actually strengthens itself. And this doesn't happen by its own volition. It is in many ways just the subject of the snow that is accumulating itself onto it. Now, the snowball actually becomes itself a snowball as it is an unwilling subject to the snow that is being attached to it. Now, when we discuss performativity, specifically in terms of gender, I think it's helpful to think about it like a snowball in that way, because gender develops a sort of critical inertia. And in this inertia, it accumulates various signifiers, the snow, they get mapped onto it over time. Now, of course, with the snowball, we're implying it get bigger and bigger, whereas with gender, it doesn't actually like grow. It changes and mutates. But this happens not by anyone's specific kind of control. Instead, we are unwilling subjects to this kind of, um, this endeavor, this kind of movement of gender through space. So, for example, I have short hair. This isn't because at some point in my life I said, I choose short hair. From the time that I couldn't even choose anything, I was designated to have short hair. And the same for those people that chose for me when they were young and before then and before then. So there was a kind of steady progression here. No one chooses this. It rather happens by certain societal, cultural forces that all point to the designation of certain people to look and act a certain way in accordance with a cultural, social, political belief about how they should look. And this looking, this kind of act of self-presentation is performativity, but it isn't chosen. I really need to emphasize that. There's no volunteerism behind it. It just happens to us. And we are all subject to this. Because we're talking about it in terms of a performance, even though it isn't a performance, but the kind of act of displaying oneself, we'd be all too quick if we were to say, oh, well, this is you know a capitalist invention because of the way that marketing happens, because of the way that we are sold, especially in the case of women, sold like makeup and skincare products and everything like this. And it becomes all about presentation. Butler's like, no, no, she's describing a situation that has happens all the time. It, it is something that 
predates capitalism because there are certain codes and conventions that determine how we should act and exist in the world in relation to our supposed sexual identification, our, our gender or sex. With this, Butler is cautious because she doesn't want to say that, oh well, biological sex doesn't exist. In fact, she's very clear about saying she doesn't know. But what she does know is that the various signs that we use to denote gender, to denote sex, have changed pretty dynamically and drastically across time. So it's kind of arbitrary that today we think short hair, most of the time, is reserved for men. There's nothing natural about short hair. There's nothing natural about the kind of clothes we wear, because for a long time it was seen, for example, that women couldn't wear pants because they were, you know, for men. It's totally arbitrary. And the same thing with skirts. Why is it that skirts are refused to men? Totally arbitrary. There's nothing natural about these signs and codes. So Butler's like, I don't know if there's a true biological determination about how we act in the world. But what she does know is that the signs that we use in this performativity, in performativity, aren't natural, so to speak. But that doesn't mean that they don't come to possess a kind of cultural value as though they were natural. So in the repetition of these kind of signifying icons, like men have short hair, men wear certain clothes, men like to play with guns, none of these things are natural objects or ways to present oneself in the world. But in that process, in these repetitive utterances in these repetitive acts, performative acts, in that they happen day to day, they aren't like specific uh, demonstrations, in these acts they come to take on the status of natural. So you know it's actually not all that surprising because over time we see things happen again and again and again and we reason through that, we say well they, they must be natural. Like I've only ever grown up knowing that you know, men are supposed to act a certain way and women are supposed to act a certain way and that's it. So it must be natural, like everyone does it, everyone does it, when in fact, that's not the case. There are various forces that contribute to this. So one of them would be mass media that seek to present only certain kinds of identities, only certain kinds of bodies, while refusing to represent others. So if you watch any kind of like television show, for instance, certain people are meant to look a certain way. Women aren't allowed to be fat. Men are for some reason. There's nothing real, there's nothing representative about that, about the whole. But we come to internalize these images as being true. And then we have other various forces take, you know, science or take, take a study, for example. So if we have a situation in which people are formed to act a certain way through repetition, not because of a natural predisposition that they have, let's say we were in a situation like that, which we are, and I were to perform a study, and I took a, a random study of like 10,000 people, men, women, people identif who identify as such, and I were to say, you know, fill out this survey about what you like. And then I get the results and I find out, oh, well, women tend to prefer, you know, makeup, whereas men tend to prefer spending their money on sporting events. So therefore, there must be something natural about women liking makeup and men liking sporting events. It's a very uh, restricted example, I know, um, and I'm obviously straw manning a lot here. But just for the sake of demonstration, what that would show is that apparently there's a kind of trueness to these ways that people exist in the world. It's a kind of sleight of hand to make us think that these things are natural. So in this process, in this, these repetitive acts, what we see is the constitution of a, of a normalizing framework. So if those people that you know, fit within the framework do everything that they're you know, meant to do, the way they're taught because of these repetitive acts that have long existed before them, then they will most likely, it isn't guaranteed of course, but succeed in the world. Whereas those people that do not pass, those people that do not fit the mold of, you know, 
white, mostly white, uh, you know, heteronormative, thin, um, you know, physical bodies, they will be excluded. So then we see what the stakes are in that it's establishing a kind of punitive system, one that punishes those people that do not fit in. And it constitutes and gives kind of encourages those people that do. And that is, I guess, more or less what performativity is about. If I, you know, if I'd said anything wrong, I'd love to hear about it. Um, you know, if anyone has anything to add, please leave a comment uh, because I'm, you know, I've read this stuff, but I'm not, I don't have a PhD in Judith Butler's work, so I could very well have a, messed something up here. And I'd love to hear about it if you feel like putting in the labor. Take care.